This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were three gables, five orange pips, and a sign of four, but there are hundreds of other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about how much money Holmes actually collected from the Duke of Holderness? Or why Watson constantly had to read the telegrams to him? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Burt Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 411, The Continental. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. Bert, have you had your continental breakfast today? <laughs> yes, but it was the lost continent of Atlantis, and everything was very drippy with salt water, and I'm not going to do it ever again. Oh, dear. Well, you don't know what you're missing. I mean, the, the calamari alone at uh, that buffet <laughs> is wonderful. <laughs> um, well, this should be fun. We are on to one of our monthly features our travel series. We're going to look at a very specific journey this time around, one that takes us from the heart of London onto the continent and beyond. And it takes place in May of 1891. If you think you know what that journey consisted of, well, you're probably right, but you'll probably still want to tune in to hear what we have to say about it. As a reminder, the show is available on any podcast platform you have or wish to listen to us on. And you can support the show by going into the show notes or to SherlockHolmesPodcast.com, where we will direct you to our Patreon and to our Substack. Uh, And there you can find various ways to support the show uh, if you would like to get bonus content, if you would like to get thank you gifts, or if you would just like to, out of the goodness of your heart, ensure that a show of this quality and of this production keeps making it to the airwaves or not. I, I, I suppose that's the danger here. If, uh, if you don't feel this is the quality you're looking for, then, well, don't hurt us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, And we would be delighted to hear from you if you have anything to say to us, uh, if you have suggestions for topics for new episodes, we would love to hear from you via email. Just hit us up at trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com. Okay, Bert, are you ready for another journey? Yes, absolutely. I've got my toothbrush packed, ah. and I'm all set. Well, that and uh, your Ely's number two are all I think we should need. Hmm. Well, in this case, we start out in the final problem. Of course, Holmes manages to rouse Watson by knocking at his window, uh, climbs in and tells him that, uh, well, in no uncertain terms, that the game is afoot. And he said, I I have my plans laid. Um, You know, he's getting ready to capture uh, Moriarty and his gang. He said, I can't do better than get away for a few days, which remain before the police are at liberty to act. It would be a great pleasure to me, therefore, if you could come onto the continent with me. (laughs) Well, now in those days, Bert, I suppose as these... What do people mean when they say, come on to the continent with me? Well, getting off of the great island of Great uh, England 
and uh, onto the continent where there exist countries such as France and Germany and uh, Belgium and uh, Switzerland. So getting from London to the continent is, you know, was it was a big deal in the Victorian era. It would take, you know, if you if you want to look at how long it would take, um, and I haven't mapped this back to the events of the final problem, but it would take roughly about 12 hours, assuming there are no delays. If you were in London and you said to yourself, you know, a croissant in France would be really nice. You needed to make that decision about 12 hours before breakfast, if that's, that was your objective, because that would be about the fastest time, assuming, assuming no delays. It could take several hours longer, and somebody who's not in a hurry might break their journey at a hotel for the night. And the fastest route, if you're in London, was to get a train, obviously, to go to either Dover or Folkestone, and then take a steam ferry to uh, Calais or Bologna. Uh, I'm just thinking about where these things are. And then take a train to Paris. And trains are faster than, if that was your idea, and trains are faster than ships, so it's, it's quicker to get the train to the channel ports than, you know, to take a short ferry voyage, um, boarding a ship in London and, and sailing to France. And, and in the old days, you'd look at Bradshaw's Continental Railway Guide, and you'd find companies that it advertised. I think the Southeastern Railway was the one that operated the Folkestone Boulogne route, and they claimed to be fast and cheap. And then there was um, the Royal and Imperial Mail steam packets company on the Dover to Calais route that was shorter. And so if you're prone to seasickness, you want to go uh, Dover to Calais because uh, that would help you. So, uh, you know, typically you'd, you'd uh, you know, be getting out of London at 8.30 in the morning. And if you went to Folkestone, you know, basically, you know, you'd wind up in Bologna around 4.30 in the afternoon and then you'd get to Paris close to midnight. So that was mm. kind of kind of what, you know, would be happening. It's, but I haven't mapped all that back to the actual uh, things described in um, The Final Problem, which is a very different route, I think. It is. And I think what's the most interesting about this particular journey is that it is probably one of the most detailed descriptions of train journeys that Holmes and Watson take together. Uh, we'll, we'll run down exactly what those steps were, but they also took a detour along the way. Um, I, I thought at first it may be because they wanted to go to Waterloo Station to get the Chunnel train, but um, <laughs> it turns out that was not, in fact, the case. So let's, let's begin at the beginning as... Holmes tells Watson what he needs to do in order to prepare. He said, um, these are your instructions, and I beg, my dear Watson, that you will obey them to the letter. For you're now playing a double-handed game with me against the cleverest rogue and the most powerful syndicate of criminals in Europe. And he says, uh, dispatch your luggage uh, that you intend to take by a messenger addressed to Victoria, he means the station, not the queen, tonight. <laughs> and in the morning, send for a hansom, desiring your man, meaning his uh, doorman or his footman or his uh, uh, you know, buttons, whoever he has manning the door, uh, desiring your man to take neither the first nor the second, which may present itself. All right, take the third cab. And he'll, you'll drive to the strand end of the Lothar Arcade, handing the address to the cabman, upon a slip of paper with a request that you uh, that he will not throw it away. Have your fare ready, and the instant that your cab stops, dash through the arcade, timing yourself to reach the other side at quarter past nine. You find a small broom waiting close to the curb, driven by a fellow with a heavy black cloak, tipped at the collar with red. Into this you'll step, and you'll reach Victoria in time for the Continental Express. Ooh. How's that for details? Well, that's, that is really just uh, amazing. Um, you know, it's not um, clear uh, how long it took Holmes to 
make all these arrangements. Is it from mm. the the final problem? I mean, uh, yeah. he's, he relates his conversation with Moriarty and, uh, you know, talks about what happened afterwards. And... Um, uh, he said, I, I went about midday to transact some business in Oxford Street. Right. After he finished with uh, Moriarty. And then, of course, yeah. he got attacked. Yeah. Right? The, the van came by and whizzed around, was on him. And, uh, you know, then he dashed up uh, by Marlebone Lane and a brick came down from uh, yeah. one of the ceilings, et cetera. So he, he had a busy afternoon. But he said, uh, I took cab. Uh, I took a cab after that and reached my brother's rooms in Pall Mall, where I spent the day. Hmm. Right, so there he could have coordinated with this mysterious fellow with a heavy black cloak tipped at the <laughs> collar with red. I wonder who, could who that, that be? could be. Santa, um, <laughs> undoubtedly, <laughs> undoubtedly. Except it was a red cloak tipped in right. white. Right. <laughs> Watson should have should have mm-hmm. noted that better. That was, that was dirty Santa after the chimneys hadn't been cleaned. Oh. Yeah. oh. Dick Van home. Dyke was falling down on the job. There you go. Well, the interesting thing, too, of course, that's Mycroft. But the interesting thing, too, is that, you know, that last detail – you know, you'll reach Victoria in time for Continental Express. After that, Watson says, where shall I meet you? Oh, at the station. The second first-class carriage from the front <laughs> will be reserved for us. So he's he's even done that, you know, which is really quite amazing. Yeah, what's more amazing is that it wasn't the first second-class carriage. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, so there, uh, the next morning, Watson uh, obeys Holmes's instructions to the letter. Um, and he said uh, he got to the arcade and he hurried at his top speed. And there, you know, again, remember, Watson's limping through uh, the city with his leg wound, right? Mm. Uh, and uh, the broom was waiting with a very massive driver <laughs> <laughs> wrapped in a dark cloak who whipped up the horse and headed to Victoria. So, uh, so he says, all, all had gone admirably. My luggage was waiting for me. I had no difficulty in finding the carriage. Um, but of course, it was marked engaged. And it was seven minutes from the time that the train was due to set out. And there was no appearance of Holmes. No sign of him whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, he spent a few minutes helping a an old Italian priest who is trying to make a porter understand in broken English that uh, his luggage was supposed to go through to Paris. Mm. And, uh, and lo and behold, that Italian priest ends up in that first class carriage with him. Mm. Amazing. 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 Quite so. But, yeah, but you know, the interesting thing is that as their train is, is, Beginning to leave the station, Mm. Watson sees a tall man pushing his way furiously through the crowd. Now, that's Moriarty. And so Holmes says, you see, even with all of our precautions, we've cut it rather fine. And Holmes then tells Watson about the attack on Baker Street and says, you know, after basically he says, look, after I was attacked, they must have lost my track completely. Uh, otherwise, they couldn't have imagined I'd returned to my rooms. But however, they'd evidently taken the precaution of watching you. And that is what brought Moriarty to Victoria. Now, Holmes goes on to say, you did not have made, you could not have made any slip in coming. Watson says, oh, I did exactly what you advised. And did you find your broom? Yes, it was waiting. Recognize your coachman. It was Mycroft. Um... As this is an express, well, says Watson, this is an express. The boat runs in connection with it. I think we've shaken him off pretty effectively. Well, now, wait a minute. So if Watson followed Holmes's instructions to the letter and Mycroft was the coachman, how is it that they were following Wat- uh, Watson and that's what brought Moriarty to Victoria? Right. Right. Uh, that is a good question. I'm, evidently, Moriarty must have been staking Watson out. I mean, w- which means he, you know, was probably in a cab nearby waiting to see Watson set out. 
But mm. that means Moriarty too would have had to uh, hoof it through the the Lothar Arcade on foot, mm. and then get another cab near where Mycroft picked Watson up. Yeah. So it's uh, I don't know. It's it's a little suspect there. Mm. Um. But he says, um, uh, well, this is an express as the boat runs in connection with it. I think we should have taken, uh, shaken him off very effectively. Hmm. And Holmes kind of poo poos that and says, you, you didn't understand uh, hmm. what I meant when I said this man is not on the same intellectual plane as myself. Now, you don't imagine that if I were the pursuer, I'd allow myself to be baffled by so slight an obstacle. Why mm. then should you think so meanly of him? Mm. So he said, well, well, what will he do? Well, what I should do? Well, what would you do then? So it's almost like uh, who's on first. <laughs> um, I'd engage a special. All right. And uh, he says, uh, well. And a special, we should tell our listeners, is the Victorian equivalent of an Uber. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a it's a custom uh, train, you know, probably with uh, an engine and one passenger car, hmm. uh, and maybe a fuel car as well. But uh, hmm. that that would allow him to pick up speed. Um, but of course, the the special has to have special arrangements with uh, the trackmen and the linesmen to be able to traverse all of those uh, points and whatnot as it makes its way uh, after the uh, the boat train. Hmm. Yeah, and then uh, Holmes tells Watson, look, here's, here's the thing. This train we're on now is going to stop at Canterbury. And there's always at least a 15 minutes delay at the boat, and that's where he's going to catch us. Um, so here's what we're going to do. At Canterbury, we get out. And we are going to go cross-country to New Haven, and from New Haven go over to Dieppe. And Moriarty will, would probably do what I'm going to do. He's going to go on to Paris, mark down our luggage, and wait for us at the depot. So we're not going to do that. We're going to treat ourselves to a couple of carpet bags and uh, buy things during our travel. And in that way, wander over to Switzerland via Luxembourg and Basel. And uh, they do that. They get to Canterbury, and they find out they have an hour's wait before they can get a train to New Haven. Hmm. And so uh, that's the point where they're at the station and they, they hide behind a pile of luggage and they see Moriarty in the special flying along the open curve which leads to the station. There he goes, says Holmes as he watches the carriage swing and rock over the point. Yeah, yeah. See, had he deduced what I would deduce and act accordingly, that would have been really something. Mm. Uh, and we've so, got we've got a lovely uh, Sidney Paget illustration of that scene. Uh, that actually is our uh, uh, the the art for this episode. But we also have a self captioned version that we did in a contest a few years ago. <laughs> we've got that available for our. Uh, Substack and Patreon supporters. So if you'd like to see that silly caption, uh, check it out on either of those platforms. Mm. So, uh, so here's here's my question: If I were in this situation, if I knew Moriarty's thinking, if I were Holmes and Watson, my move after getting out at Canterbury would have been to just get on the train going back into London. <laughs> right he, he would not have expected he'd go go into london stay at a hotel for a few days i mean he's off on the continent trying to chase you around i mean what's the point <laughs> well that's great actually yeah i rather like that but i uh, think i think i see why they didn't do that oh it's do because you? yeah holmes let watson lead this part of the effort and of course watson was leading with his stomach. <laughs> right? The question now is whether we should take a premature lunch here or run our chance of starving before we reach the buffet at New Haven. Mm. And this is probably a good time to remind folks that we actually did an episode, mm. uh, episode 218 
where we talked about buffets. Back when we were doing a, a series on food and the canon in season five. So uh, we'll have a link to that episode in the show notes. So Holmes and Watson headed for the buffet at New Haven. Hmm. And uh, he said, we made our way to Brussels that night and spent two days there, moving upon the third day as far as Strasbourg. On the Monday morning, Holmes telegraphed the London police. And the evening, we found a reply waiting for us at our hotel. And uh, he said, he, he said, I might have known it. He has escaped. Well, of course he escaped. You made him chase you to the continent. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, they secured the whole gang with the exception of Moriarty. He's given them the slip, which yeah. shouldn't have been that much of a surprise, really. But yeah. uh, he said, uh, Watson says, we sat in the Strasbourg salle manger arguing the question for a half hour. The same night, we, re we resumed our journey, and we were well on our way to Geneva for a charming week. We wandered up the Valley of the Rhone, and then branching off at Luke, we made our way to the Jemmy Pass, still deep in snow, and by the way of Interlaken to Meiringen. Hmm. But now the interesting thing, I mean, we were talking about this before, was um, why New Haven? And obviously, can Dover is quite close to Canterbury. Well, quite close. It's, it's certainly close. <laughs> Well, the, the deal here is the distance between Canterbury and uh, New Haven is something like 70 miles, um, which doesn't sound like a lot to us in, in the age of motorways and automobiles. <laughs> but it's not a trivial thing to get from Canterbury to New Haven, which is why, why Holmes says, you know, should we eat here or should we try the buffet in New Haven? You know, um, But from Canterbury to Dover is mm. a fraction of that amount of time. I mean, That's it can't right. be more than 20 miles or something like that to Dover. Yeah, um, I think it is. Uh, well, if I leave now, let me see what <laughs> Google Maps says. It, it's about a 17-mile a journey, 29 oh, minutes. Yeah. There you yeah. go, 17 miles. By oh, car. Not a bad estimate. Uh, and, and if you were to take public transport, it would be a half an hour. Oh, okay. So there is a yeah. so, and of course there's but, Folkestone too. But I don't know that there's any. It probably were ships leaving Folkestone. Yeah, but, maybe, uh, maybe, but but if if you point a, a an arrow from Canterbury to Paris, um, either either uh, Folkestone or Dover is almost directly in that path. Mm. I mean, more more directly is Calais. Right, it's a straight arrow, straight shot from Canterbury to Calais. Hmm, right. If if you pulled out your handy uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps and saw, well, where is New Haven with respect to all of this? Well, it's actually southwest mm -hmm. of Canterbury, mm. and as you say, about, about 70, seventy miles, miles southwest. Yeah. So it is considerably out of the way. Hmm. Well, hence, you know, Holmes's um, route here, which is to get to Switzerland by way of Brussels. So, actually, he's made a longer channel crossing. Well, not really a longer channel crossing, because he's got to go um, to France anyway. So, he's got to go from New Haven to Calais, and there must have been steamships that do that, and then from Calais to Brussels... So the good news is that the distance between Calais and Brussels is less than the distance between Calais and Paris. Mm. And um, now how, how that actually would work, Watson doesn't describe that in any detail, but I imagine that, um, you know, in that area, Brussels is the major destination. Uh, I think it's the biggest city. Um east of Calais, so there must have been a well-established route. That's my point there. There must have been a way to do that. Yes, indeed. So um, so they make their way to the continent. They uh, bum around for almost a week. You know, this, this wasn't a matter of Holmes and Watson, uh, you know, 
jettisoning themselves out of London over the weekend, and then that following Monday making their way to, to Reichenbach mm. or, or to Meiringen. This was a trip of uh, over a week. Mm. So it was a considerable, uh, well, considerable expense and a considerable expenditure of time. Mm. And, of course, we all know about the final journey of Professor Moriarty, uh, which was from the top of the falls to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> After that, uh, Holmes managed to make his escape. Um, he said, uh, it didn't take me long to think about it. I knew there was somebody you know, uh, trying to assault me from above. Uh, he said, uh, halfway down, I... I slipped on the ledge, but by the blessing of God, I landed, torn and bleeding on the path, took to my heels, did 10 miles over the mountains in the darkness, and a week later, I found <laughs> myself in Florence. So Quite a run. Amazing. Holmes, boy, he really puts down the miles. I know. He must have really known <laughs> a good cobbler in Italy. <laughs> um, <sighs> and then from uh, Florence... Uh, he, well, he confided in, uh, in in Mycroft. Mycroft wired him the money or, you know, helped uh, make arrangements. But from there, he said, I traveled for two years in Tibet mm. and uh, on to uh, through Persia, looked in at Mecca. He had a visit with the Khalifa at Khartoum, uh, communicated with the foreign office, back through France. Uh, he was in Montpellier in the south of France and then back to London all over the course of three years. Mm. Well, and there's been a lot of, lot of things written about that described journey by me and by lots of a great many other people pointing out things like, well, now, wait a minute. Uh, the Khalifa actually wasn't in Khartoum then. Oh, no, no. It's the thing about the, the Lama. He's in Tibet and he uh, spent some time with the head Lama. But, um, you know, regardless of all of that, it's a, you know, it's a remarkable journey, and it's not until he's uh, busy with some chemical researches back in France that he hears about the strange murder of Ronald Adair, which prompts him to return to civilization. Indeed, and that's a long way to go for a buffet. <laughs> Well, I really like your comment about, well, why did he do that? Why didn't he just say, I have a great idea, Watson, Birmingham. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go to Birmingham and uh, see if we can spend a few weeks, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, silver manufacturing businesses in the jewelry district of Birmingham. Yeah. Oh. Who would have suspected? Yeah. Well, mm. uh, this journey is anything but a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Here we are, Holmes. Bradshaw, sell them, let you down. From Ashford Junction, we can take the one o'clock slow train to Hastings. Then on to the dear old London, Brighton and South Coast Line. Becks Hill to Lewis non-stop. Then on to New Haven. Evening boat to Dieppe. I think we've got time for an early lunch.